Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. My guest this week is Dr. Nicole Gauthier. She is a professor and extension specialist at the University of Kentucky. Her program focuses on disease management of specialty crops, including hemp. In her extension role, she develops educational and outreach programs to help growers manage disease through identification, understanding of pathosystems, and integration of management strategies. Her research program focuses on a range of hemp diseases, including fusarium head blight. Dr. Gauthier earned her Bachelor of Science in Horticultural Science and her PhD in Plant Pathology from Louisiana State University. She joined the UK College of Agriculture in 2011 and began working with industrial hemp in 2014. There will be a link on the podcast page to access her resources and research. Now on to the show. Hi, Nicole. Thanks for coming on the show today. Hello. How are you? I, I'm good. I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you today. Uh, I've seen on LinkedIn that uh, Paul Coxon, who's been on the show before, had linked to some of your research. So I reached out to you directly and you were so kind to take my message, uh, messages. And um, can we just start off telling listeners a little about yourself and then we can talk a little bit about your research? Okay, sure. I am um, a plant pathologist, which means I study disease. And um, actually, I am a, I'm a professor of plant pathology with a specialization in extension. So extension specialist is what a lot of uh, farmers call me. And by extension, meaning that we are the interface between the university and growers. So every state has extension uh, faculty. And then uh, most counties within a state will have a, a, another component of extension. So I'm a specialist. I specialize in plant diseases. And by crop, I work with specialty crops. And hemp has been on my um, commodity assignment since 2014 when the reintroduction came through with the 2014 Farm Bill. That's, that's really exciting. So you're sort of the... Uh, the, the bridging the gap between academia and the university and then the actual farmers and growers in your the, the fall into your area is that that is correct? correct so I can work directly with farmers as long as it is a plant disease issue or I can work with county agents as part of their larger programming so they're kind of boots on the ground um, and then um, <clears throat> I, I write a lot of spray guides and fact sheets and do a lot of training. So we train growers and we train county agents. So a lot of trainings. And um, of course, in the modern era, our trainings can be anything from YouTube videos. We have a YouTube channel. So anything from YouTube to um, just some, some um, uh, featured videos that are a little bit more... Um, more published than some of our raw video out in the field. Okay, well let's just let's just go ahead and dive right in. Now, sure. one of the things that we talked about off air was just getting a good foundation and understanding of sort of what plant disease is and what those what those are in sort of the hemp cannabis world right now. Okay. So, uh we'll start by saying that plant diseases uh, those are the symptoms. That's a plant's reaction to whatever is happening. So it's an it's a um, it's a disorder. So when we talk about disease, we use terms like wilt and rot and blight, and those are usually descriptors. Um, now we have disease names, so those are kind of more colloquial, right? So think of entomology or think of uh, plant names. Like we don't use the Latin binomial every day. We're using common names. So that's what diseases are. Disease names are common names. Um, so we'll call flower blights or leaf spots or cercospora leaf spot or bipolaris leaf spot, uh, powdery mildew. So those are kind of some, some, um, some common names. Um, so, um, 
diseases are caused by plant pathogens. And that's when we get into um, fungi, bacteria, viruses, uh, water molds, or oomycetes. So that's when we start talking, uh, start talking with the Latin binomials that um, most people don't really like to talk about. Of course, any pathologist would love to talk to talk the nerdy uh, Latin to you. But um, so when I study and when when um, a lot of times we make references, we do make references to those Latin binomials because that causal agent or that plant pathogen, the fungus, the bacteria, the water mold, it's really critical that we know what that is. And that's where my research comes in. And so that's, yes, I have the education and outreach component from extension, but that's where our research really dives in. Um, <clears throat> so to answer your question is we're trying to figure out what exactly are those causal agents or are they the same? Is it the same cercospora that causes a leaf spot on soybeans or on tomatoes? Or is it a different cercospora, for example, that causes the leaf spot on cannabis? So that is kind of part of the research that I do is um, kind of a fancy diagnostic, if you will, and then understanding the life cycles. Uh, what are the alternative hosts? What is that host range? How does it overwinter? What are the optimal conditions for infection to occur? And um, thus, do, the, does the disease matter, right? Does it just make a spot, for example, on that leaf and it's, eh, it doesn't matter? Or is it something that can be really devastating and, and detrimental to a crop and cause crop losses or, or food safety issues? So nutshell, that's what I do. Yeah, so it sounds like identification is, is critical in the entire process. And I know that's something that in reality kind of gets skipped over or um, I guess pushed aside a little bit. I'm, I'm wondering from a grower perspective, how important is it that I know the actual species or can I just say, oh, this is powdered mildew because of the way it presents and that's enough for me to at least begin a treatment option or for something, you know, something else like fusarium or one of these other uh, more common diseases, do we need to, do we need to dive that deep as a cultivator, or can we just sort of narrow it down? Well, you're talking to the pathologist, so I'm going to say absolutely <laughs> yes. Uh, so most of the time, though, yes, we're finding more and more as we we have more modern techniques. Now we're starting to understand a little bit about just crops in general. Why may, why did management this management technique work five years ago, or why is it working for my neighbor and it's not working for me? Um, and um, it, it may be really the 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 pathogen itself. I'll use fusarium as an example. Um, you know, people who are not pathologists they talk about fusarium as if it's one thing. Um, there are so many different fusarium um, complexes and species that uh, we're finding, um, for example, as a fusarium wilt, we have identified four different um, forma specialis of uh, fusarium oxysporum. Um, so we're finding a lot of different ones and that starts to matter. That matters uh, on how it overwinters, what the other hosts are. And, and we do a lot of fungicide sensitivity tests. And I know I don't want to get anyone in an uproar, but Fungicides are used for a lot of crops across the board. So in plant pathology, that's one of the ways we characterize pathogens is what is that sensitivity? We also do temperature sensitivities. We also do, we do a lot of different characterization studies, but fungicide sensitivity is kind of like an in your face. It, it shows differences, right? Um, and think about species. What's the difference between a cat and a lion? Right. There's a huge difference in what we know in our everyday lives. So there's just as much difference across, for instance, fungal pathogens and um, and, and the fusarium, the fusarium oxysporum group or the fusarium or well, all the other species, the ones we're working on that cause a um, bud and flower blight, head blight. Um, they're very different and it matters. It can matter more than others. Um, another another question you mentioned, powdery mildew. We know that there are two different powdery mildews, different genera um, of powdery mildews. Which one do you have? Well, one of them prefers about a, it can survive at about a 40% relative humidity and the other one more in um, more than 70% hum relative humidity. That's huge. 
40 uh, percent relative humidity really plants are unhappy at that level versus 70 percent relative humidity you're kind of plants are really happy there but so are most of your fungal pathogens for example and i, I have i have a million other examples of how species are are, are genera sometimes it really makes a difference in in the grand scheme of things okay that, that was a very compelling argument <laughs> so <laughs> basically it's hard though, right so should a grower should a grower care a commercial grower should absolutely care um a small grower or a backyard grower or a, um you know somebody with a grow in their basement um won't matter as much um but a commercial grower should absolutely know because that's really that sometimes that difference between um that real good profit margin or that that really um high level efficacy of a management strategy versus just okay and we did we did well so if I, I, so I hear what you're saying. You're basically saying that, you know, even within Fusarium, we're going to have ones that have different temperature ranges, different humidities, um, a, a different spread. All of these things are factors. So, so it does matter. I, I guess as a grower, then, so if if I were to walk into my my room, let's talk about an indoor facility. So controlled environment agriculture. Um, I, I see something on a plant that looks off to me. Um, how do I determine that that's a disease and not a nutrient deficiency? What are some keys that I would look for in terms of uh, a physical display? And then what should I do at that point? What are my next steps from a pathology perspective? Okay, so, um, so remember symptoms are not a diagnostic feature. You need to know, you need to see the signs. You need to find those fungal spores or whatever. And a grower is not gonna have that capability. Don't expect you to, right? That's what we're here for. But if you walk into your your basement or your huge facility or, or, or a field, like whatever it is. So you kind of walk in, you take a look across, right? So kind of take that wide angle view. Imagine that first look, what's the pattern? Um, if it's a nutrient deficiency, it may be across the entire block or the entire, you know, house or whatever that is. Um, planting date. So when I talk about block, it could be planting date, it could be cultivar, it could be a lot of things. So, but if you look across that entire block, a nutrient deficiency can very likely be all of the plants. Plant diseases are rarely all. They're usually, we usually have hot spots. Um, or if you're on a drip irrigation system and you have an irrigation issue or a, a fertility issue, it, it, there may be some kind of pattern, right? Um, or if it's a cold end of a greenhouse, maybe you have a, an air leak on the cold end of the greenhouse. So you'll start to see kind of patterns. Um, the low end of the field, the high end of the field, the cold part of the greenhouse, where is the heater that may be you wouldn't believe how many people have gas powered heaters or kerosene heaters in their greenhouse. Um, or it may be something like if there's a clog in one of the irrigation lines, maybe all of row 10 um, looks different than the other row. So what is the pattern? Um, and then you're going to look a little bit more closely. Look at the whole plant. Um, is it the entire plant that's going down? Is it just the new leaves? Is it just the old leaves? Um, is it just one side? So right, a fusarium wilt just one side will start showing symptoms first. So what is the pattern within the, uh, an individual plant? You're going to look at multiple plants, but what's going on? And from there, then, the, then my number three is you go down into the soil or the, the media. And you're going to look at roots. You're going to look at the crown. What's happening, right? Could it be mechanical damage? Rodents, for example. A lot of rodent issues or, or if it was a clogged irrigation system, what does the root system look like? If it's a root rot issue, what do the roots look like? So you're going to kind of look there. So you're, you're still just gathering information at that point, but you're giving a sweeping look and then you're closing in, closing in. And from there, from a leaf, for example, if you have a root rot, well, then you'll have a leaf die back. That's a wilt, right? Because if you're losing roots, you're not getting the water and nutrient uptake that you need because the roots aren't there to do the, to do the job. So you might have a wilt um, maybe a 
consistently for an entire week, or maybe when it cools off at night, you'll the plant will recover. So there's that kind of wilt and recover phase, or you might have a marginal leaf scorch. Marginal leaf scorch is an uptake issue. That might be a root problem or, or maybe salt buildup in the media. So just kind of gathering, it's, it's kind of like, um, it, it's kind of like a, a, an, an, um, an investigation, if you will, right? Um, just eliminating the obvious. And if you still keep saying, okay, I'm still going back to root. This is still, I'm still thinking there's a root problem. Well, then you can investigate a little closer or you can say, this is a very clear leaf spot. There are fungal structures inside that spot. I'm gonna go to leaf spot or um, a bud blight. You know, what is it, what's happening? So a bud blight generally won't affect the leaves or, you know, so it kind of, it's kind of putting together um, all of that that information so that you can take that first guess. But there there will be patterns, or there will be um, hot spots, or there will be something to give you more information. But it takes some thought, and there's no book, there's no checklist um, that gets you there. You it's it's experience and feel, but it's also taking that wide angle look. Could you, if you were on Facebook or Instagram, see a photo of a cannabis plant and be able to diagnose it just from that photo as having fusarium or, I mean, powdery mildew, I guess, is probably an easy one. But... Powdery mildew is the only easy one. <laughs> okay, so that's my question because I see this all the time where you're like, you'll see people post photos and they're like, oh, that's fusarium. Oh, that's phytoptera. Oh, you know, whatever. What? What are your thoughts on that? I, you know, just as a pathologist. Um, besides, uh, there are very few pathogens that we actually see that we see the sign. Otherwise, we're seeing the symptoms. Um, if we are going to communicate, for example, you and I are very far apart. So if you called me, I would say, send me five pictures. I want to see the whole greenhouse. I want to see the entire site. I want you to look for patterns for me, right? You have to be my eyes. Um, so sending photographs and just trying to narrow it down in exactly that pattern of thought, that thought process that I just laid out, um, to show me one leaf rarely, um, to show me one plant rarely, there's more to the story. If it was a fusarium wilt, for example, I would make you cut into that stem. Um, I would make you cut into healthy plant stems. I would make you tell me the history of that site. I would make you tell me a lot of things, but until I saw those spores, I would not, especially in a commercial, in a commercial setting, tell you that you have a specific disease. If I have a jeweler's loop, for example, or uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the dino light. It's a little fancier. Yes, I have dino you know. lights. Ah. I've got pro scopes. I've got a. Okay. <laughs> I've got it all. I have a dino light too. So what? Let's just go with dino light because that's kind of okay. a little bit better than a, a jeweler's loop. If I was a grower with a dino light, uh, what could I? What diseases could I identify with that tool? Okay. On my plant. Okay. So for you growers who don't know, a dino light is a USB powered little handheld microscope. And um, magnification can get pretty good. Um, so you can see a fungal structure like a pycnidium. Um, so septoria leaf spot is an example. And if anybody wants to just Google septoria leaf spot, just write right up on their computer as they listen to this. Um, inside that leaf spot, that fungus will produce a, um, a structure, a survival structure called a um, pycnidium. Pycnidia are like capsules, okay? They're the size of a black pepper flake and they're raised, like little pimple-like raised and inside are those microscopic spores. But um, pycnidia are very large. I say very large. So from, for, from a pathologist standpoint, they're very large. Um, young eyes can see them without, uh, without a jeweler's loop, right? Without a hand lens. But um, if you zoom into some of those, those types of spots, you can see canidia and canidia force, canidia or asexual spores, and they stand up on little stalks. The stalks are called a canidia four and the canidia will be on the end. And they'll cluster, they'll look like maybe little bristles. And so with a, a, with a dino light or even a jeweler's loop and good sunshine, you can see those structures. 
And over time, you become familiar with the same ones over and over. Um, you can't put me in a, um, in a wheat field and I'll be able to use my loop to identify certain structures. You become trained um, with the things that you see over and over. But if it's a fungal disease and it sporulates, we can usually see enough that I can take a guess. And we can circle back to this in a minute. But your question was, when does a what does a grower do in the meantime? And we could double back to that. So usually if I see enough, we can give a grower some guidance until we get that confirmation from the lab. Um, but there are, there are fungal structures. You can never see bacterial cells with a dino light, uh, but you can see oozing, you can see water soaking. You will never see viruses. Um, viruses are the absolute hardest, even symptom wise, it's very hard to guess. Mm -hmm. Um, but even with a dino light, you can see things like a, um, like a root infection. Um, you can see where that infection might have taken place. Pythium, for instance, pythium root rot. That pythium will infect from the root tips, whereas black root rot, you'll see lesions within the, uh, within the root. Along the root, you'll see those, les those small lesions there. A lesion nematode is another one, right? A lesion nematode kind of goes in right to the side of the root and it'll create a small lesion. So we can see those kinds of things. And remember, I was talking about narrowing down from the field level. You can also n narrow down when you're at, at that magnified level, even if it's not a high powered microscope from even that hand lens or dino light level, you can start narrowing down. Um, okay, root tips or okay, um, this this flower blight is is on the calyx or I'm sorry on the bract um, or on the pedicel like where is it happening and and magnification mm -hmm. gets you closer to those things it's a better it's a better communication for you and I so that when you do submit that sample you get the right sample and then of course we can help you with a management strategy until we get that confirmation back so. I mean, I, I kind of want to, <laughs> we could go one of two ways here. I kind of want to talk about some of these diseases and their life cycles, but I also want to talk about treatment options because like the first thing when you say, uh, you know, when I think of a lot of these things that are on the leaf surface, I want to spray something like Ceph oil X, like a, a mineral oil based, some sort of oil based suffocant. Um, are there better options that are safe and approved in cannabis than that? Um, or is there something, how do you approach that, I guess? So we're in a really difficult position um, with cannabis because the, the products that are out there are, they're new to cannabis, they're new to these production systems, they're just new. And also in cannabis, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, and, and that's why you've got this podcast, right? That's where I'm working in this space because there's so much to do. So, um, but oils are really not good, uh, fungicides. Um, they're, they're oh. just not, um, they're, they're great for suffocating a lot of, uh, arthropods, but they're not something I would ever list in my fungicide arsenal. Um, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of, uh, biologicals that are really just starting to, to, we're just starting to understand them, right? So you've got your bacillus products, your trichodermas, the eulocladium. Um, so we're just starting to see some of these products come on the market. Um, I, and really, I am really loving a lot of those bacillus products. Um, there are some really good ones out there. Um, and, and trichodermas also have their place. Let me say that we use biologicals differently than we use our conventional fungicides. So it's not wait for disease and spray and, oh, it didn't work. Um, it, it's the opposite, right? You've got to have some preventative, preventative measures. And, and we, could, we, could circle back to, um, we can circle back to cultural practices, but you've got to be able to use these, these products as, as often living objects, right? They're either um, SARs or they're living ob uh, um, organisms. So they also need um, 
humidity. They also need certain conditions to, uh, to, to survive and to do on that leaf and to do what they need to do. Um, there are a lot of questions about persistence. How long are they on that leaf, right? Once you spray, how long are they on that leaf or on that flower or in that soil? So there, there's a lot to be learned there, but, um, the best things I think we have on the market are your bacillus products and your trichoderma products. And, um, I do not have a favorite bacillus. Um, from what I have tested, they really work pretty well, all, all pretty well. Um, we've got some research going on. Ask me again in a year. I hope to have a lot more information, but so far what we know, they're all kind of right there, um, doing the best that they can with what we throw at them <laughs> with a monocultured system in a very humid indoor environment. And, uh, you know, farmers are abusive. <laughs> like we don't treat our plants well. So we put a lot, we put a lot okay. on them. Right. Yeah. Honestly, that surprises me a little bit about oils. I, I was not aware of that. Um, I, I've used the oils because, and, and this is another thing to talk about too, is how much are insects and pests spreading disease or pathogens too around your room and, and killing you know, some of these arthropods, like you mentioned, I think could, I, I assume would have some effect as well on reducing or preventing disease spread. Um, I have, I haven't had really good success with biologicals. Um, once I've identified disease in the room, um, right. it seems like at that point it's too late. I, I mean, I don't know. I would love to hear you just talk a little more about this. And I'm thinking in my head, I'm thinking of powdery mildew just to give you a little more context. Okay. Any disease, right? Um, so your biologicals, I like to say they're not a magic, a magic bullet in any way. They are not going to cure. Not, nothing cures disease. But our conventional fungicides, which by the way, there are none uh, labeled for any cannabis or hemp product. Um, mm -hmm. your, conventional, your conventional fungicides... Um, they're tough, right? They're really good and they can suppress. They're a great big band-aid for two to three weeks and your biologicals don't do that. So your biologicals must be used preventatively. They must be used preventatively. And we say the same thing about our conventional fungicides, but they, they have a staying power that biologicals don't. Um, so, so if you have a history of a disease, um, you must use your biologicals preventatively or at the first sign of, or first symptom of a disease, hands down. Um, powdery mildew is, powdery mildew is like, it, it's like easy, but it's tough. Like I, it, I have, I have mixed feelings about that one. Um, with powdery mildew, and for those who don't know, what you're looking at is actually the fungus. It is a mass of um, canidia and canidia fours, right? So those are the, the canidia fours that stalk and then the canidia are those um, hyaline or clear um, asexual spores and they form in chains. So those are chains of spores. The fluffier that mycelia is, the longer those chains of spores are and they're airborne. And what do you do in an indoor grow? You've got fans on, so you're blowing it around. Um, so when you see powdery mildew, you've got more spores than you can come, than you could possibly count on a single leaf. Um, just, just really high numbers. That's what makes powdery mildew so hard to manage. Also remember there are a couple of different powdery mildews out there. And, um, uh, one of them in particular, um, it's, it's relative humidity. It can infect at a relative humidity of about 40%. That's low. That's dry. Um, so that, this, so this is one of the situations where it's sometimes hard to even use cultural practices for management. Is there any human risk with the amount of spores in the air when you do spot powdery mildew in a room? Are you, would you like go running out of there to put on a mask or is it not something to worry about? That would not be something to worry about unless you're immunocompromised. And if you are immunocompromised, it's really hard to be in any agricultural setting, right? For just a lot of the things we do. Um, then, another thing about powdery mildew, can I, can I add one thing about powdery mildew? Oh, absolutely, that some absolutely. people don't know is that powdery mildew, the white, the nice fluffy white mildew that you see, if you will, um, that is only, that's the asexual stage of that, uh, that fungus. And so 
later in the season or at the end of its life or as plants begin to senesce, it will produce a different type of structure called a chasmothecia. And that is an overwintering capsule um, that will, that's, that's going to initiate that sexual recombination, that sexual stage, but it's also the overwintering stage. And chasmothecia are like some little um, round Velcro balls, like they, they have appendages and they stick to things. So your powdery mildew is going to stick. It's going to stick to anything um, that's that's coarse. So any kind of wood, any kind of table legs or any kind of pots or containers or um, so it's going to stick on everything everywhere. In the field, it's sticking on the stems and debris and um, it's hanging out. And once those chasmothecia, they're, they're black, they're dark colored. That means they're melanized. When they're melanized, they're UV resistant, they are heat tolerant, they're cold tolerant, they are fungicide resistant. So that is that carryover from season to season. Um, so following a greenhouse in between, but sanitizing a greenhouse in between crops is really critical. If not, you're leaving those chasmothecia in place. So again, we're back to that life cycle. We leave those chasmothecia in place each year you've got or each each crop you've got more and more of that inoculum in place ready to ready to infect so many questions but let me <laughs> <laughs> let me start with a couple so my first question yeah. is um how are, are the are the powdery mildews that we're seeing in cannabis also um ones that could be uh could, could other plants be carriers, whether those are cover crops, squashes, I think of like in my outdoor garden, um, that sort of thing. And then two, uh, just so I don't forget my questions, uh, biologicals, which you mentioned being effective, are, are challenging in that we can't, a, a lot of states are testing for microbial contamination on the buds themselves and not differentiating bacillus um, species in terms of what's safe and not safe. So that that's another thing. And then um, how effective is just water at killing powdery mildew? I've heard that it can, you know, there's a physical mechanism of just rinsing it off the leaves too, potentially. So, sorry, that was a lot of questions, but I don't want to forget them. That's a lot of questions <laughs> and that's two hours worth of answers. Okay. Oh, <laughs> okay. So what was the first question? Now, now I've forgotten the first question. Uh, other carriers, uh, other, carriers, other that's right. okay. cross species <laughs> contamination. So what we finding and back to speciation and my, my favorite thing in the world to do speciate everything is that, um, our powdery mildews basically do have a wider host range than we have, than we have known in the past. So yes, Golovinomyces chicoraceum or Golovinomyces spadaceus, um, absolutely is the one that you're going to see on wildflowers on weeds on other crops it is out there yes um so um do you it, always it see it on around. weeds like What's i'm that? picturing indoor facilities that run cover crops um inside the facility itself like you know some of these cover crops have very narrow leaves they're smaller um you'd have to look really closely is it possible that you may not be seeing the spores or um or something like that too, I guess. Yeah, so so it manifests differently. Sometimes it's not as preferred host. Sometimes mm -hmm. it, um, you know, and, and so it will look differently. Also, um, you know, again, so we've got a lot of levels and you and I were talking about this last week. You've got a lot of different types of growers, right? And your listeners are probably in a very wide range from um, two plants on the, black, on the back patio to a commercial facility that is sealed. Um, but even in your larger facilities, you would be surprised at how much outdoor air is coming in. So mm -hmm. remember the fluffiness, remember everything you see in powdery mildew is spores, is mic they are microscopic spores. So there's a lot of powdery mildew blowing around. And so just air exchange through a fan, through an open window, through a, some type of uh, ventilation system is bringing that powdery mildew in. So, uh, and again, once it's in there, it's there for a very long time. 
And I'm, I'm going to laugh and I'm going to tell you that this pathologist cannot get rid of powdery mildew in her own greenhouse. We have followed, <laughs> we have disinfested, we have done everything and we can't get it. We cannot eradicate it. So it is tough. Um, wow. It is really tough. So think about the entry, it is coming in and then it's building up. And so once you have powdery mildew, which everybody does, uh, once you have powdery mildew, if you you know, how many of us are guilty about after we harvest, we leave the plants in place, right? We don't really get rid of them like we should. And then, so that's when you start seeing those chasmathesia develop. You might not see them, but they're there. And can uh, it only, go ahead. Can it only grow on living tissue, powdery mildew? Powdery mildew can only establish and, and, and survive, no, live, but it will survive as survival structures. So, right. Um, but you can go, you can go years with those chasmathesia, those survival structures being viable and waiting for a crop. Yeah, I'm full of bad news, right? <laughs> so, Does tilling the soil have any positive effects in terms of potentially killing the chasmathesia? Is that the correct word? Asthma, Am I saying it right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, it's usually somewhere on some surface. It's it's not as much on this on the soil or in the soil. So tilling it into debris, tilling the debris in, yes, that will bury it. But it's in other places, right? So if you have a hemp field, it's on fence posts. If mm -hmm. or you know, it's clinging to anything. Um, it's clinging everywhere, and there's always some debris. There's always something around. But in an indoor facility. Um, I don't know any grower who truly does a full disinfestation between crops. I mean, wash floor to ceiling. So MER filters though can be effective at reducing that or is that getting outside of your area of- That's getting that outside of my area, but your um, your filter size your uh, will affect, you know, it, it determines which particle size gets in, but you still sure. have to walk in, right? And again, yes. the best facilities are are rare um so not just filtration but opening of doors and you walk in right you've been outside and you walk straight into work during the day do you really suit up do you really shower i mean not many even our best grows are not a not the level of a containment facility it's going to come in and once it's in it's very it, it's going to establish yeah, no, that's that's really helpful. Um, so I, I guess what I'm wondering then is, you know, we talked a little bit about these biologicals and how in a lot of states we have testing that doesn't allow us to effectively use them uh, because of the the regulations, essentially. Um, which leads me back to oils and then my question about water and sort of mechanical means of removing powdery mildew. Um, how effective are those things? say in the vegetative state before we have the formation the flower formation oh wow okay i'm gonna start with your second question uh water so think about how powdery mildew infects so the um so this is a cuticle infection so the infection um, is right under the cuticle so it is not literally on the surface so the sporulation is on the surface but there is a there's a level of infection so if you wash it down, you have spread those spores and then you have not gotten rid of the infection. So the fungus will pop back up. So I would not, I would not waste my time. I don't see where that could even buy you any time, like 12 hours, but powdery mildew sporulates right back. If you have a mist bench, and, for example, if you have cuttings and you have a mist bench, yeah, powdery mildew is not real happy, um, but you know you haven't gotten rid of the infection. You just kept it kept it at bay for however long your plants are under the mist. So, what tools do we have then as a grower in our current system besides oils? I guess we haven't talked about soaps at all. Um, um, if those are insecticidal soaps or anything like that. Do those have any fungicidal properties? Not really, not enough. Um, so we've we've got we've got um, 
I, I don't like to, to mention products, but there are a couple of products on the market that do a pretty good job. And um, Regalia does a good job. Um, um, I have a, a study that we use Cease, uh, which is a bacillus. So mm -hmm. uh, Cease does a good, a good job um, used properly with other cultural practices. Um, that's kind of been our best bet. And uh, if you look at some of my old work, um, a student did a project several years ago where uh, one of our growers had to use organic milk and uh, he did, and that was one of the most effective. But again, um, you need a lot of applications, right? So it's not just one, uh, one application like most growers, especially any grower who goes from a conventional system into something like cannabis that you can't use conventional products. They're highly disappointed. But um, there are some products that work well um, when combined with cultural practices when combined with air circulation and uh, following greenhouses in between crops, those types of things. So I heard about that, a study like that um, through the giant pumpkin community, actually. I wonder if this was, if your student and you were the ones that did that original study or were you guys replicated no. something around that? No, we just did it. Uh, we did it when we were uh, looking at some products in powdery mildew in hemp in the greenhouse. And, uh, you know, we, we had all kinds of crazy things in that study. Anything a grower told us they used, all the, you know, the anecdotes and uh, mm, old wives' okay. tales, we kind of threw those in there. So we had bee propolis and we had all kinds of things. Um, but the, <laughs> the milk, the organic whole milk, and it was a powdered milk mixed. I don't remember the details of the study, but it did pretty well. So <laughs> it... Um, do you know but if the again, mechanism... anything you use that's not systemic, you're going to have to spray on a five day interval. Oh, that's that's a good point then. Okay, so every five days just because of the life cycle of the yeah. of the mildew. So do you know if it was an enzyme or something in the milk itself or the lactobacillus? Because I know a lot of growers are using lactobacillus and making their own what they call labs essentially and spraying that. I don't remember. Um, it's not something I pursued. I did some powdery mildew work years ago. Um, I've since worked on other things, so I don't remember the details of that study. I'll see if I can find it. If I can find it, I'll give it to you to link to your, uh, okay. <laughs> your bio and your, uh, show notes. But, um, but yeah, well, it's, uh, powdery mildew is tough, especially indoors. Well, let's talk a little about what some of the other diseases are that you're seeing, uh, prevalence of and maybe how they're misunderstood or misdiagnosed right now by the oh, cannabis wow. community. Oh, wow. I could go forever on that. All right. So another really <laughs> common one in indoor facilities. Now, when I say indoor, that means um, a true indoor closed facility. It can mean a greenhouse. It can mean a basement. It can mean anything except the field. Okay. So I'm going to use that term very generally. But any indoor environment where you're using a soilless media, the premise, uh, the premise there, and now this can also include hydroponics or anything in that line as well. Um, it, it's pretty, we'll call it sterile, uh, for lack of a better term. Um, so you don't have the antagonists, you don't have the, the, the microorganisms that you would in a field situation. All right, we'll, mm. we'll kind of set the scene there. Um, so uh, Pythium is probably number two right behind powdery mildew and any indoor grow any soilless mix or soilless um or, or hydroponic system if you will and that's because there are no antagonists um also we do a lot of watering in a soilless mix we're also in it's wet right we're either flood we're either flood benching or we are you know having dripping and just just it's just wet in an indoor environment because we've got pour through. And uh, Pythium um, is a water mold. It's an omycete. It's not a true fungus. And so once Pythium comes in, it's got roots, it's got water, it doesn't have antagonists. And that's another really persistent fungus that is, uh, or, or pathogen rather, sorry, not it's not a fungus. It's a really persistent pathogen that a lot of growers struggle with and often fail to recognize what's really going on because it manifests as 
a nutrient deficiency. It manifests as a lot of things. And um, of course you get wilting and the more you, more it wilts, the more you water, the more you water, the happier Pythium is because it's water mold. Um, so there's a lot of Pythium in our systems. Um, I know that we have five different species that we have identified. We've got the cool weather Pythiums and we've got the really hot greenhouse um, Pythium species. So there are a lot of Pythiums out there from across the board and we're finding lots of it. Um, so just knowing you have Pythium would be a, a big deal, but to know which one you have kind of complicates things unless you have a lab that's willing to do that for you. So when we, uh, when we suspect we have Pythium, our identifiers, like you said, it's going to lead the above ground material is going to look a lot like a nutrient deficiency, but I would assume when you dig down into that media, you're going to see a very distinctive, I mean, I've always called it root rot, um, sort of brown, slimy roots. What, what are the distinguishing characteristics of Pythium relative to other pathogens? Okay. So, um, for everybody listening, when you, when you expose those roots, rinse very slowly, right? You don't want to break those roots. Those roots are really brittle when they're infected. So your younger, younger plants are going to become infected more. They're more susceptible. Um, a young plant, like right, a new cutting or a seedling or just a young plant has more of those young tender roots. Um, they're more susceptible. The older a plant is, the less, the less problem you're going to have with Pythium. So it's an early season disease. So think about timing. Um, whereas um, nutrition is usually a problem later in the growth, the growing cycle. Pythium is a, a root nibbler. So it comes in on the root tips, the very tips, and it goes upwards. And once roots get tough and strong, yeah, it doesn't really like that. Um, so you'll see them more on the tip. And if you rinse slowly and you take a look at those roots, so you were saying brown and mushy, that's extreme. You want to catch it before that, right? So when it's that extreme, you've got stunting and dying. And But whereas if it's a if it's the, the beginning stages and you've just got that myochlorosis or maybe it's stunting, maybe it's not, I'm not real sure. Could it be the cultivar? So when it's, when it's at that low level, looking at those roots. So you want to look at the tips of the roots with your dino light or your hand lens or whatever you have to magnify. Um, I know some of my growers who have an old fashioned magnifying glass. Don't be too proud for a magnifying glass, whatever it takes to magnify. And so what you want to look at is the root tip. The root of an affected, uh, infected root will be flatter. It won't be really turgid. It'll be discolored, not necessarily brown, maybe starting to turn a little gray. Um, and at the tip, very easily, the cortex will slough off and just that steel will stick out. So we call that r rat tail. So a rat tail root tip is my favorite indicator of Pythium. So um, picture again, the cortex left off and just the steel sticking out. Sometimes it's a very small amount. Sometimes it's maybe as much as an inch, but you have to rinse your roots very carefully so you don't break them up. And you can see those sometimes with the naked eye. The older I get, the less of the seeing things with the naked eye are possible. But um, a little bit of magnification. Heck, turn on your phone camera and zoom. It's usually enough. So if I spot Pythium on my plants, they're they're looking you know like you said you caught it in early stage we growers tend to diagnose these things probably too late but assuming we caught it early what what options do we have to for treatment oh bad news again um so some of your <laughs> trichoderma products are good preventatives so let's back up if you ever have pythium in your greenhouse you probably still have pythium and i'm saying greenhouse your indoor environment you probably still have pythium um, again, fallowing, starting over, cleaning, sanit disinfesting, sanitizing everything, every tool, every piece of equipment from wheelbarrow to garden hose to flushing out your irrigation lines, um, cleaning everything out and starting from scratch, making sure that when you get a delivery of your media, you're not throwing it on the ground outside. Surprising how many people do that. So then your media becomes contaminated. But um, 
So to go in and if you have a history, to go with something like a trichoderma or something like that. So really you wanna get those plants to that six week stage. And once you get to that six or eight week stage, they toughen up and they're pretty good, unless you really have a severe infestation. Pythium is a soil borne pathogen. It lives its entire life in the soil, which means that any propagule, any spore is gonna move with soil. And when I say soil, I mean soil and soil is mixed and water. Mm -hmm. So it's moving, it's moving anywhere that soil particles would. So it's under your shoes, it's on your hands, if your hands are wet, it's on your wet pruners, it's um, on your wet clothes. It's definitely under the bench on the ground, any crack in the, in the concrete under there. So it's everywhere and you're moving it around, you're moving it very easily. One spore rarely will, will set off an epidemic but there's rarely one spore. And then of course, once you add a host plant that's highly susceptible, and then you add all that water because it's a water mold, remember, then you've got that slow buildup of inoculum and then suddenly, bam, you're hit with a disease epidemic. You're like, where did this come from? But it slowly creeps in. Um, so sanitation, sanitation, sanitation. There's nothing you can do. No perfect fungicide will do a good job without sanitation. And being we don't have a good fungicide, <laughs> sanitation's all we've got. Okay. Yeah, because we, we do work with a lot of growers that are using soils that have a compost fraction. They're they're using more biologicals. So we do have, I, I guess what you said, like more antagonisms to Pythium. And frankly, I, I haven't seen a lot of Pythium with a lot of the grows that we work with relative to other, other diseases. But... Um, if we want to reuse that media, for example, if we were growing in a, in a, in a bed versus a, a disposable media, would repeat applications of trichoderma or something like that have a potential, the potential to at least reduce it below an economic threshold? Um, I really don't want to say yes to that. Um, okay. you can, <laughs> if you... I'd rather see you steam it or, or somehow sterilize it, right? Somehow heat it up. I'd, I'd much rather see you do that with anything um, in a greenhouse. Think of a hospital. A hospital is quote unquote sterile. That's how staff kind of takes a hold or, or something else in a hospital, right? Uh, that's what happens is those antagonists are not there. So even if you've got some compost in your media, you still don't have the antagonistic, you just don't have, have the biodiversity that you have out in a field. That's why you don't mm -hmm. see a lot of these problems in fields. You see different things, but that's why you really don't have a lot of these in the field because um, you've got really a, a, an entire uh, ecosystem. You're never gonna create an ecosystem in an indoor environment. So you've got to keep it on the sterile end um don't reuse your media if you do have a good steamer or have something to be able to really heat it up um two weeks at 110 degrees fahrenheit would uh make me happy but 110 <laughs> degrees inside of a large container is different than 110 on the surface so why why can't we create uh successional functioning ecosystem in indoors because I, I know that compost contains higher microbial biomass overall um it may contain less diversity but but I, i'm just curious to hear your thoughts on that oh that's really not my area but think about <laughs> think about an ecosystem is underground at soil level right? So it's your rhizosphere, it's your phylosphere, it's the, it's the arthropods in the air, it's the microbes. And so it's, it's bigger and you mm -hmm. don't have that in an indoor environment, right? Um, it, it's not going to be a biodome. It's not, you know, you would have to really open up. So you can't have like a micro ecosystem um, alone. Right. So if you've got a, a, a micro ecosystem, it's happening in the bigger ecosystem outside, but you can't produce a micro ecosystem in a container or on a bench. Mm -hmm. Whereas the rest of that greenhouse doesn't have the, the components needed um, to support the rest of it. Yeah, that's something I've been thinking about because we have 
Well, we have growers that you know want to do things that are more organic and be more natural, and and this idea that things that happen in nature are somehow better than other things, even though agriculture in itself is is fairly artificial, growing monocrops and and harvesting them so consistently. But you know, I, I some of the facilities we work with, like one of them has had the same media in place in in their rooms for over eight years, and I know they've battled just about everything at this point, and yet mm-hmm. they're able to continually produce product um i'd love to see more research around what sorts of ecosystem successional ecosystems are created in soilless media that's being reused over time just from a sustainability that, perspective that would be really interesting right and because you know i i could go down a whole sustainability rabbit hole but there is so mm-hmm. much waste um that i i would like to see that too that would be really nice um think about though that without the full spread of antagonists, that when something is introduced, it mm-hmm. it can just get away from you. So this grower you said that's been reusing media, um, <laughs> that's a unicorn. It would be nice if we could say that. And I, I would love, I would love to stick my hands in that in that system. Um, mm-hmm. But it's it's unusual for that to happen. And it just takes one introduction, um, one introduction of a pathogen that um, that really can it can set can set things off in the wrong direction. But if they're good growers and if they're careful about what comes in, if they're planting from seed and um, usually when we're moving soil borne pathogens, we're moving them in soil. And again, soil, soil is mixed. So, you know, if you get cuttings from someone else or anything like that, sure, yeah. that's where you're kind of reintroducing versus um, I know grow like vegetable growers who only bring seed in because they have less chance of some of those. They're seaborne pathogens. It's a whole nother. That's a whole nother podcast episode. <laughs> but um, but yeah, it, it's really about introductions in the end. If you don't introduce it, it's not there. You can't have disease if you don't introduce the pathogen. Totally, that makes to- total sense. And you know, one of my best friends is an entomologist who I've had on the podcast, and I understand from a pathology perspective, from an entomology perspective, like you want to keep things as clean as possible, um, That's just right. to avoid any issues in the in the very beginning. And so this this idea of reusing media creates a lot of <laughs> a lot of a lot, a lot of, risk. of risk. Yeah. And I a think that's something risk. people do need to be aware of. Um, I plant outside because I'm a I'm actually a I'm really an avid grower for outdoor outdoor production. But again, that's a whole I'm sure you'll get that has it. its other challenges from <laughs> a growing perspective. A yeah. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're not without we're not without challenges, <laughs> especially yeah. when you invite a, a pathologist to talk about it, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, just in the interest of time, because I know we've been chatting for a while here, there's so much more I want to ask you. But um, originally, I'd reached out because of some of the research you had you had uh, contributed to um, out of, out of Kentucky University of Kentucky there. And can you talk about a, a little bit about the the silica paper? I knew you were going to ask me about the silicon paper. So, <laughs> yeah, if we could start with that one, and then I want to touch a little bit on the other fungicide one that you did too. Just okay. you know, even if we, if we just spent a couple minutes on it, that would be great. Okay. All right. So we uh, we did a test where we used um, where, where we applied silicon to um, soilless media in the greenhouse. This is my greenhouse with all of the powdery mildew that I cannot get rid of. Um, and that was a, a Golovinomyces spadaceus, I think, was the was the powdery mildew. And um, we used three different rates of, um, of um, silicon. Um, I'm trying to think right offhand, like 250, 550, and 800 pounds per acre, the equivalent. So we did the math, and so we did all of this in in, um, replicated trials. And then we had two different cultivars. Um, One was highly susceptible to powdery mildew, and one was moderately susceptible to powdery mildew. And um, basically, we so we started our plugs in uh, um in these media and then we transplanted into larger containers also so we started really we set our clock when we actually transplanted into i think it was the equivalent of three gallon pots if i remember right and um we we grew those plants for six weeks and we looked at we rated the amount of powdery mildew on those plants um and this was by the way this was wallacinite uh wallacinite sorry. I, mm-hmm. um, 
And so um, essentially that um, 600 kilograms per hectare, which comes out to 535 pounds per acre um, calculation, um, that is what that really managed powdery mildew to uh, really low levels for an entire six weeks. So you're talking about uh, what, are, what our um, arsenal is. There's a lot of work that needs to be done with silicon in, um, in cannabis altogether. It is an accumulator, by the way. That's a whole other part of that paper. Um, we confirmed that it was an accumulator. But um, we, we were looking at 80 to 80% 80 reduction in the amount of powdery mildew compared to the non-treated control. It was fascinating. That's that's incredible. And well, last night is a very affordable option. A couple things I think of. Um, so when last night, calcium silicate, um, like I said, very affordable. Uh, you, it will raise your pH and it will add calcium to your soil. So you'd want to account for that in your fertility. Um, if you were to add it, like I wouldn't just add it indiscriminately to get to the silica levels. I assume you guys looked at the fertility there too. We did. Yeah, we did. We adjusted pH. So that that is all in the paper. Yeah. So um, I just wanted listeners to think about that before they just go mm -hmm. running out to grab last night. Um, yeah, that's right. Is there any is there any future research around other types of ways of adding uh, sil silicon to soil? No. So here in Kentucky, um, we have sufficient amounts of silicon in our soils, in our natural soils. Um, so it, it's not something we think that would be beneficial at the field level, um, definitely at the greenhouse level in soilless mix. We do know from other research in other systems that Bipolaris or Cospora, Fusarium, Septoria, or all have all been documented, uh, confirmed to be um, reduced by um, silicon in soilless media. So those are all big pathogens in, in hemp in particular. And so it would be really great if someone would pick up that torch and run with it. I don't see that in my future. I just have other things. Um, mm -hmm. But, it, but um, cannabis is an accumulator and um, a lot of cannabis pathogens are known to be um, reduced by silicon. Yeah, I did a whole pod podcast on silicon with another um, <laughs> with another university research, and it was it was amazing. I, I learned so much about it. Um, one thing I will add, if people are using wollastonite, is to make sure that it's not high in heavy metals because there is a lot of heavy metal testing now happening. Uh, being that it is a mined product, that's another thing to account for uh, for folks. But that's uh, that's wonderful. So I'm excited to see where that research goes. Uh, can you briefly tell me a little bit about your other research that you did comparing uh, biologicals and fungicides on hemp? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. So um, that paper in particular, um, it was, we called it pre-screening. So this was all done in vitro. We did this in the lab in uh, Petri dishes, and we, we did a variety of, um, of screening methods. So uh, one thing we did is we um, amended media with different biological fungicides. Um, we also had our conventional fungicides as our controls, right? So what was that comparison? So we, um, we had another, um, another test. So we put um, a strip of, um, or a stripe of, a, um, of a fungicide, a biological across the center of a Petri dish. And then we put plugs of our pathogens on each side. And so that was so the, the, um, the premise there is that if some of these pathogens produced any kind of metabolite, that was the antagonistic component. Um, so there was the direct um, antagonism, then there was like, some release of some kind of metabolite. Then our third um, screening method was that we um, mix spores with a suspension of these fungicides. So that might be ones that, that needed time, right? So 
Um, so we did that mix, then we plated those spores out and we looked at germination rate. And so one of the things that um, we don't know about of a, lot of a lot of our biologicals is how long do they need to be on the surface to actually work? If you spray them at noon and you know it dries up and whatever's in there doesn't have time to work, uh, whatever that mode of action, those are some things we didn't know. So we developed this pre-screening method that we were um, hoping to see. And really, there was a really wide range. And um, I have not just the, the paper, but we did what we call a, um, a translational piece where we kind of write the research up for, for growers who don't want all the nitty gritty uh, scientific jargon. And uh, there's a table in there that we added that really just shows all of the different types of, of experiments, like how, how to best screen those things, um, which products seem to have the best results. And so this is intended to be our next, our, our first step in what will be a series. So our, our, our next go-to is we're gonna take select products, the ones that did the best in some of these studies, and we're going into the greenhouse. And then from there, right. we'll take the next, the next group and they'll go into the field because um, we can't afford to put everything in the field. Um, there's not much hemp uh, or, or we have to, all of our research at the university is on hemp, by the way. So if anybody who's wondering why I keep saying hemp, um, we cannot work on marijuana at the university. Um, yeah. So um, so we can't afford, so the, the, the funding is just not there. So we can't just bring all of these products into the field and test for all of these different pathogens. It's not possible. So we have to, we have, to have some kind of pre-screening method. Where do we start? Um, where, where is our time best spent? Where is our money best spent? So that was the premise of this pre-screening method. But you can look at this table and you'll see that a lot of these products are working in a Petri dish why don't they work in the field? That's where we know it's not the product. It's our use. It's our application method. It's our time of mm. application. There, there are other questions. And when I said at the very beginning of our conversation, we don't know how to use them. Um, we really don't. So we have a lot of things coming up this year and next um, where we're going to start teasing some of this apart. So if it didn't suppress well in a petri dish is there ever a case where you might get an infield response that would be surprising or is that a product that we may not want to necessarily use at this point in our garden i know you can't make recommendations necessarily but just as a general rule so a general rule if there is for example systemic acquired resistance you're turning on an immune system in your plant that mm -hmm. product should not work in a petri dish Right, because it does not have a direct effect on the pathogen. It's a it's a plant immune response, and so we do have a couple of those in the study, and um, they didn't do well. Of course, they didn't. Um, we knew that, and we say that very clearly in our conclusion. Like this is not so. So if you are going to look at this study, by the way, any of your listeners, um, be careful about what we're actually what we're actually saying there. Right? Um, okay. Regalia is one. Like regalia didn't do well in this study because it's not meant to. It has another mode of of action, um, and I've picked on regalia twice today, and it's a fabulous product but this is not what it's meant for. Mm -hmm. So that is, and, and we know, we know those most, so we have, we have conversations with these manufacturers. They tell us what we're, what they expect it to do and they guide us along the way too. They developed it, they know their products. Yeah. Um, so yeah, a systemic acquired resistance would be the one that we would not expect to do well in our pre-screening, but we would definitely bring it to the field. Yeah, I mean, we haven't, we didn't really talk about SAR responses and how products might trigger that or different applications. I right. have questions around chitin and the chitinase pathway and if those things affect microbes. There's so much I would love to ask you, but I, I know we've been talking for a while. Maybe we could do a follow up when you have some more research sure. or when you have some more free time. I would love that. Absolutely. Um, well, well, thank you so much. One last thing. Uh, so you work with people in Kentucky that are growing hemp. Um, you're not available to work with just any old person who just 
has a plant disease. Uh, what resources does someone like myself in Washington have? Where should I begin to search from a pathology perspective to get assistance with, with my plants? So you need to know where your local plant disease diagnostic lab is. And in some states, you can, um, your university uh, diagnostic lab will take not just hemp, but cannabis as well. Some state labs, and on the West Coast, there are state labs. They may or may not also take those. Um, there are some private labs out there. We've seen a little bit more of those. Um, get to know people, though. Um, really um, be careful where you go. Make sure you have an actual pathologist and not just someone who's been... Uh, <laughs> who's been reading a lot of uh, online articles and um, really get a diagnosis. And that, that gets you started. And even if there's not a reference on that pathogen in cannabis, you can at least learn that life cycle. And we talked about some examples today, but knowing those life cycles and knowing overwintering and survival of a pathogen will take you so far. I can't say that enough. Um, we didn't get to talk about environmental conditions or humidity or temperature, <laughs> and so we'll definitely have to do that again. But um, I, I would love to have you back on. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I think I think uh, plant diseases is like in and this sort of thing is one of the biggest challenges for growers. And there's so much that we don't understand, and there's so much misinformation. So I really appreciate your time today and you sharing great. all this with us. So okay, well, right. thanks a lot, and. Um, if you have any questions, just reach out to him. That was Dr. Nicole Gauthier with the University of Kentucky, and you are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. Don't forget to check out the podcast page at www.kisorganics.com. Just click on the Learn tab, then Podcast. And if you want to access the podcast as soon as they are recorded, Along with additional content and video, we do have a Patreon account that we are just starting up again. The Kiss Organis website also offers a variety of soil amendments, lighting fixtures, beneficial insects, and the highest quality commercial soils on the market. We carefully research all the products we offer and manufacture to make sure they are science-based and meet our standard of quality. Thanks for listening.